Today we're going to cap it off by saying if the goal of emotional renewal is uh, a fullness, capacity to live in joy, greater confidence, a sense of, of meaning and purpose about your life, greater peace in your life, then how does renewal actually take place? I mean, how does it actually, what are the mechanics that has happened? Well, the mechanics of being re uh, renewed emotionally all resolve and revolve around the issue of guilt, all right? So, with that in mind, we're going to embark on a happy, joyous discussion of guilt today, <laughs> together as one. No, you know, guilt is the number one thing that undermines your sense of value. In the way Jesus heals you emotionally is He focuses on establishing your value. And not just saying you're valuable, but He does things so that you know you are valuable. I want to read to you a quote from uh, the book Search for Significance by McGee, and this is what he says. Perhaps no emotion is more destructive than guilt. And since it's an emotion here, see, he's talking about psychological guilt. He says, it causes a loss of self-respect. See, that's a value question. It causes the human spirit to wither. It eats away at our personal significance. Guilt is a strong motivation, but it plays on our fears of failure and rejection. Therefore, that's what's interesting, it can never ultimately build, encourage, or inspire us in our desire to live for Christ. Now, throughout this series, we've talked about various people who are dealing with emotional traumas and how God wants to heal and restore them, but they're getting caught in traps. I talked about Sarah uh, on the very first uh, message in this series, how she in high school had gotten pregnant and she gave birth to her child. Her family kept it very quiet and they gave the baby up for adoption. Five years later, she's in college, and she meets this guy, a really good Christian guy. Uh, after a couple of years out of college, they get married. After a couple of years of marriage, three years of marriage, she says, hey, I want to start a family. But the difficulty is she's carried this guilt with her so much of what happened is that she eventually says, well, before we start a family, I have to tell him what really happened. So she tells him, and of course, he responds uh, in, in a very Christ-like manner. And he says, oh, okay, I'm sorry you had to carry this. You know, you're forgiven. We're restored. This is okay. It doesn't have to affect us. But the saddest part of this story is, is that she felt so guilty is she ends up divorcing him to punish herself. And we're going to read a lot of the Bible here, but I want you to get it. The first one is in Titus chapter 3. We've talked a little bit about this before. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard, so if the words are sometimes a little bit different, uh, that's why. But this is verses 3 through 8, and listen to this, okay? We also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various passions or lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So what is he saying? He's saying, look, every human being has passions and lusts or pleasures, all right? And what happens is we get enslaved to those things in order to try to do what? Heal ourselves emotionally. He says it's kind of a foolish pursuit because it doesn't really work. He says what it produces is envy, hating people, right, and being hated by others. So a lot of people today are asking me, why is our society, why is America so toxic right now? I mean, everybody seems to hate everybody. Um, man, 
If you are trying to date today and you get on the dating profiles, it used to be you would say something like, well, I'm this tall, I like to go fishing and ride bicycles and things like that. But now on your profile, you got to say what your dietary restrictions are, right? Because, man, you, if, if you're a carnivore, do you want to go out on with a date with a vegan, right? I just read about this, this guy, he's a, he's a French model in France, and he's kind of zinging across the internet right now because he went out with this girl, and this girl said, well, I don't eat gluten. He goes, no eat gluten? What is that? He gets up and walks out of the date right there, you know. He goes, that makes no sense to me, you know. And so it's just really funny. But you got to put on there who you vote for, Right? It's like, I don't want to go out with anybody who voted for Trump. I don't want to go out for anybody who voted for Biden. You know, I, I can't date those people. You know, it, now it's, okay, what's your position on pets? <laughs> All right. Do, are you a, a pro-pet person or anti-pet? Because if you're pro-pet, we hate you. If you're anti-pet, we hate you. I have a goldfish for crying out loud. That's all I've got. Please go on a date with me. You know? Once you have a pet, then you have to do subgroups, right? Are you a cat person or a dog person? Because those two people cannot date. I'm just saying. You see, is it, we, we've got to this point now that our society is looking for reasons to hate everybody. I mean, we just hate people right and left. Why is that? Where did that come from? Why did that happen? I'll tell you why. Because our society are pursuers of pleasure. That's exactly what he's saying. When you pursue pleasure guess what? You end up envious, greedy, hated by people, and hating others. That's what he's saying. I can't think of a better situation like that than to produce boatloads, truckloads of guilt in anybody's life. doesn't matter what you believe, what your religion is, what your worldview is. Psychologically, that environment will produce guilt in anybody, anywhere. You don't have to have a Jewish mom to feel guilty okay? You'll get it across the board, all right? Listen to what he says next, okay? Verse 4, but when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. See, what it, that's really critical for the trap of performance, Right? My value is based on how I perform. And if you want to understand that, go back and listen to the performance trap message. He says, things we had done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. There's the word regeneration, the doctrine of regeneration. Listen to what it says. He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we might be made heirs. So you're adopted into the family God as an heir according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently of them, so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds, for these things are good and profitable for men. Now let's go back to Ephesians and see what else he says about who we are and how regeneration is the foundation of emotional healing. In chapter 4, beginning with verse 17, he says, now this I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord. This I say and affirm together with the Lord. Your NIV might say, I insist upon it. So this means there's really no wiggle room here. This is the goal, if you're following Jesus, that you walk no longer as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thinking. Being darkened in their understanding, they are excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because their hearts are hard. They become callous, having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. What's interesting is as I read this, I see this as the emotional response of so many people in our society today. So many people who say, I'm just numb. You know, I'm just, I just don't, I don't feel anymore. I'm just numb. 
H.G. Wells uh, committed suicide. He was a famous science writer and forward thinker. And in, in his final days, uh, he, he basically said, I'm tired of thinking up ways to find pleasure in a day. You know, that's kind of a paraphrase of what he said. Isn't that interesting? He becomes so bored with his own life. In, in so many ways, we become callous, and the reason why is because we just don't understand that what we are doing and the way we're living is destroying our souls. We're not emotionally renewed. We're not living in joy and meaning and fullness and purpose. We're trying to manage our sins and manage our flaws, and what do we always feel guilt? We feel guilty about it. We feel so, so much psychological guilt. I'm not enough. Um, uh, I never measure up. I didn't, you know, if I would have, should have, could have done that, I would have been better off. I, you know, we just live in this constant self-perpetuated punishment of ourselves. But listen to what he says. You did not learn Jesus in this way. You didn't learn that. 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, this is truth. It's in Jesus in reference to your former manner of life, the way you thought, the way you lived, what you did. Lay aside that self the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. The reason I'm putting it away is because it's an anchor around my soul, and it constantly pulls me down. And I must be renewed. I must be regenerated in the spirit of my mind. Your, your translation might say, I must have a new attitude in my mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. I love the way he says that. I must have a new mindset, a new attitude of my mind where I must put off the old and put on the new. So the way I resolve the way of thinking that produces psychological guilt in my life every day is to train myself out of it. I want to train myself out of it. And how do I do that? Well, the first thing is I must work on developing a new way of thinking, the new attitude in my mind. And here's what's really interesting, is what I have discovered is that the number one way that people, Christians following Jesus, seek to resolve their emotional wounds is by seeking emotional experiences with God. In this series, you've learned the most important doctrines of the faith, the foundational stones on which your faith stands, justification, reconciliation, propitiation, and regeneration. In Psalms chapter 40, King David uh, wrote a song, and in it he said, the Lord has picked me up out of the miry clay, out of the pit, and he set my feet upon a rock, a firm foundation. He put a new song in my mouth. Many will see what he has done in me and give praise to his name. Many of you are holding on to your past. You're allowing it to define you, mold you, shape you. Your emotions each and every day are influenced by your past. You have heard it said, you must let go of the past, yet you can't seem to do it. The reason is because you still blame yourself in some form or another. These sins forever haunt you. So let me say something you may have never heard before. The power of the cross is the power over everything. And when you ask Jesus to be your righteousness, to redeem you and save you, those sins are absolutely and unequivocally forgiven. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. They've been washed away. So the only sin that you are committing today is the sin of holding on to the past. Let that sink in on you. The only sin you're committing is holding on to sins that God has forgiven and washed you clean. 
The truth of Paul, it rings true here like never before. I must no longer, he says, be captive to the empty and deceptive philosophies of men. I can no longer live as the Gentiles lived. Uh, these are unbelievers. They are stuck in the performance trap, living for the acceptance of others, punishing themselves for their failures over and over again, never knowing their authentic value because the guilt is all they know. The guilt of failure, the guilt of never being enough. I, on the other hand, must embrace the fullness and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit in my life. Jesus Christ came to set me free. And now, right now, is the time to be free indeed. Amen. Amen.